which has existed since at least 2004 and possibly as early as 2001. So leaving aside all the various <laughs> troubling kind of racist overtones of the macro, as well as the issue of whether it's funny or not, it's extremely popular. And you're going to get raped is now this like catchphrase that's used in competitive and argumentative contexts. Um, it shows up in a lot of places. So whether you like it or not, this is like this is the major reference for the Edward macro. So this macro, the loved tenderly macro, it functions just like the you're going to get raped macro, and it doesn't function without that um, reference, right? So, you gonna get raped plays on viewers' perceptions of black and possibly homeless guys. The subject of it is widely assumed to be homeless when you see people talking about the macro. Um, and then Love tenderly puts these assumptions in conversation with perceptions of Edward Cullen and Robert Pattinson, right? So, most members of Twatlight, when they were asked about it, agreed that Edward is abusive and uh, Robert Pattinson is homeless looking or a bum <laughs> in their words, right? Like, because you know, he'll go to like press calls looking sort of unkempt. Um, and these are like common complaints. This is not just on Twilight, right? Everybody who dislikes Twilight, it seems, says these things about Edward and, and Robert Pattinson. But the normal narrative that's being put out in the press and that people assume that Twilight fans are, are into is that Edward is the perfect boyfriend and Robert Pattinson is the heartthrob. So the cognitive dissonance is what's funny. And what you need to remember with this is that Twatlight, uh, Twatlight members are behaving in many ways like fans, right? They're, they're following obsessively everything that happens. There, I use that term. <laughs> they're following everything that happens in the Twilight books. They're following the actors' lives, etc. They just have a very different um, perspective on what is going on with this stuff. Um, so the dissonance between the way that Edward is being portrayed here and the way that he's being portrayed sort of in the media is what gives the macro kind of an analytic punch. So by aligning these two things, whoever is looking at this macro is forced to think about Edward's actions in a new light. He isn't a literal rapist in the books, right? He's just sort of creepy. But by aligning the idea of rape with being loved tenderly, the macro actually does make an argument. It says, look, his seductions are creepy and scary and every bit as frightening as that, you know, creepy guy that you're scared is going to rape you. Not romantic and sexy, like the normal narrative goes. The other thing about this is that the gaze functions really interestingly, right? So Edward is like looming and he's sort of like goofy and sort of menacing in this picture. But in the context of the macro, the viewer is given the power to say no, right? You're looking back at him, you're like, ha, Edward, you douche, um, <laughs> right? So the experience of reading a macro isn't complete until the viewer reacts ideally with humor, right? Drowning him and the mainstream understanding of Twilight out with laughter. Um, it may be a little bit of a stretch to, to bring the laugh of the Medusa into this, but I think that it's really valid because the point of this macro and many, many others like it is that they're challenging this, um, this expected gender role uh, story of Twilight with, with their laughter. Um, so I'm going to really quickly sort of skim over the next part of my thesis in which I'm comparing these macros which have totally been not um, not dealt with in, literature, in the, the literature in general with fan bids, which have been dealt with somewhat extensively. Um, and this is actually a slide that is changing now. Um, so, right, fan bids and macros behave very similarly in some ways. They're both created in communities of interpretation and criticism. Communities develop methods of reading that are difficult for outsiders to comprehend, right? So if you see a fan bid and you've never seen a fan bid before, you don't know what it's doing. Um, they can both serve as, as a way to mess with expectations about the male gaze. There's a lot of scholarship about that. Um, the de- and recontextualization of narrative are key components. Um, there are some macros that take like an entire scene and, and recontextualize it with new captions. Um, this last point actually has changed. Now I am working into my thesis that uh, there, are many mac there are many fan bids that are intended to be humorous, uh, but they don't typically get dealt with in the academic corpus. They haven't been talked about very much. Um, and I think that there's <coughs> a lot of reasons for that. I think there's a lot of reasons why things like macros, fan bids, or if we look more broadly, things like silks, right? Um, uh, songs that are like sort of parody, but sort of just for fun that fans will sing that are based in, in the, original, um, the original story world. There's a lot of reasons why these things don't get talked about in the fan studies corpus very much. 
And I think that one of the reasons is the humor element, right? It's just plain difficult to talk about humor. Um, you know, as you guys probably noticed with me talking about the Edward macro, it's always either like too serious or too unserious for academic discourse. But there's another part of this, which is that um, the fan cultures that we usually study are um, female fan cultures. And to quote Nancy Walker, humor is at odds with the conventional definition of ideal womanhood. Humor is aggressive, women are passive. The humorist occupies a position of superiority. Women are inferior. So now I want to illustrate this for you. The so I'm, I'm making this argument, right, that, that we're uncomfortable with the idea of funny women, and this is part of why we ignore humorous uh, productions by women. T to illustrate this, the first American collection of women's humor was published in 1885. Uh, I bet that most of you didn't know that before 1885 there were any female humorists that existed ever, other than maybe Jane Austen. Um, there were no collections of women's humor in English that I know of, or that Nancy Walker knows of, or that anybody I've read about knows of, until 1976. Um, and, and it was called Titters, and Titters was subtitled The First Collection of Humor by Women, because the uh, wit of women was so obscure. Furthermore, as late as the early 90s, and possibly to this day, women did not appear in any major collections of significant American humor, despite the fact they're really prominent in the humor scene. I mean, like Dorothy Parker, just, you can list so many people from even just this century, and yet they're not showing up in academic discussions of American humor. So I think that there's a good, strong argument for the fact that they've fallen out of the academic discourse, and so, you know, how do you start talking about funny female fans? Like, where do you begin with that? But there's another reason that we might exclude humor from our discussion of fans, and that's because humor potentially complicates our understanding of what a fan is. Um, so in uh, fan cultures, Matt Hills, who's one of the major scholars who's writing about this right now, um, refuses to give a definition of fan, but he privileges people who claim a fan identity, who is, and he assumes that the natural object of fan studies is self-identified fans. Cornell Sandvoss, who you can, you can see quoted above, um, says that fandom is the regular, emotionally involved consumption of a given popular text or narrative. And he uh, describes the repeated consumption of any text as affection, an affection for the text. Um, so while this seems to potentially include emotional investments that aren't totally positive, the rest of fans doesn't explore the possibility of frustrations and animosities towards a given text, too, right? He only looks at people who are like, yeah, I love it. And humor, you can see, naturally kind of problematizes this, because even the most good-natured humor is poking fun at something. Even the most good-natured humor is potentially, you know, saying, yeah, I'm not totally uncritical of this. How can you make a joke where there's no butt of the joke? I guess it's possible, but it's very hard. Um, and this especially is problematized by things like the macros that Twatlight is producing, which are also kind of biting commentary, generally speaking. Um, or funny fan vids, right? Fan vids are traditionally understood as, as critique, um, but when they're funny, it's like an extra level, like they're getting this joy in critique. Um, and that's hard to deal with. How can you enjoy making fun of something so much and still be a fan? Is that even possible? And yet, the people that I looked at in my ethnographic study of Twatlight behave exactly like fans do. They observe everything that goes on in Twilight. They discuss the themes of it. They look at the actors. They follow everything they do. I found out more from them about like what was happening in the world of Twilight than I did from the Twilight like purely fan sites that I found. So I talked in my previous these presentations about Jonathan Gray's ideas about fans, which are represented above. He uh, he claims that you have a nucleus which is the fan or the close reader, and then you've got the non-fan and the anti-fan, which are like the electrons. This makes this nice little diagram of the atomic conception of, of fandom. And they're a step forward, right? Um, you've now got a fan and you've got an anti-fan, someone who, who hates something, and they're in conversation with each other. Um, but they're really too simplistic. And they're being taken up in wider, um, in wider conversation. A lot of the people that I interviewed, without any prompting, identify themselves as, oh, I'm a fan, or oh, I'm an anti-fan. Um, and this, as I hope you can see, even if it is a step beyond like Hills or Sandvoss saying that um, you know, fans are, are self-identified fans who love the text, 
Um, it abides communities like Twilight still. It erases really complex effective engagement with text and makes it harder for us to study critical practices like cracking serious jokes. Um, I had considered suggesting uh, a term that Twatlight came up with, which was lol fan, um, as in a fan who loves to uh, make fun of something to the lols. Um, but I think that that would only mess this up even more, right? We're not going to get through this by creating more categories. Um, rather, I think we really need to rethink our concept of what we're studying when we're studying fans and, and people who are receiving a text. So my conclusions are that um, the term fan and the conception of my field as fan studies is deeply flawed for a variety of reasons. That Jonathan Gray's work to challenge this was a step in the right direction, but he doesn't go far enough um, in order to break down these artificial terms and instead be looking at the relationship of the reader to the text. Um, that this is reflective of cultural biases against women's humor in particular, um, and it also causes us to miss important cultural phenomena like macros and like other fans' humor productions, humor productions in general, really. It's not inherent to the way the field was constructed at its origins. Henry, for instance, talks about, um, he talks about silks, he talks about fan humor. Ian Ong um, initially did not even talk about fans in her seminal work. She didn't use the term. Instead, she was focused on readers who had something to say about Dallas, in her case. Um, and it's easily remedied by expanding our gaze to all effectively engaged critical and interpretive communities that are based around popular texts and all their productions. So changing the focus from this idea of here's a thing called a fan to here's a relationship that some people have with the text. We want to study the relationship and not necessarily the person. And that's it. So questions, comments? <coughs> Just to start off, I mean, of course, so um, the term fan studies is deeply flawed. Yes. What would you propose in its place? What's a better? I don't know, and this is a master's thesis, so <laughs> I don't have to answer that. <laughs> but I mean, do you have a sense of how that, that how we can circumvent the kind of well, I think definitional constraints? So I think the key for this. I think the key for this is that fan studies is a term that's not actually like, there's no program in fan studies that exists that I know of. It's not cemented yet, and I think that what I'm really arguing against is cementing it as, as a field, per se. I think that I'm arguing that it should be viewed, um, I know that. But I mean, you, you criticized the Anon for sort of talking about this as audience studies, which... I did not criticize the Anon. Oh, sorry. What, what, was your, <laughs> what was your comment about the Anon's Was study? that she did a good thing by talking about it as audience okay, studies. Okay, but is that and the answer? I don't know if that's the answer because I feel like that's something that has, I guess, I, I really don't know the answer to this. Uh, I think the audience study is potentially good, uh, but I haven't, I haven't, I guess I just don't feel like I'm in a position to say. Um, the key thing for me is that, Really, the, the key point for me has, has been that, that fan studies is giving us blinders. I also wonder about audience studies because I feel like it, it suggests that we're looking at like the non-fans that Jonathan Gray is encouraging, and I think that that's not the case. I think most people who are into fan studies are interested in that, aren't interested in the non-fans, and that, that maybe audience studies suggest that there's an even broader... I don't know. I'm, I'm babbling. I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> I want to follow up on that. Uh, you know, it, 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 I sympathize with the idea that if we focus too much on fan as a category of person, that it can pull in a lot of directions and make it hard to see something. And, and so I think the idea that to get through this or go to some next stage, very smart, very interesting. You know, and, and it's a question of sort of, it seems to me, so the answer to, well, one of the ways to think about the answer to William's question is, you know, is what are you trying to get to? Right. right? You know, you say yeah. get through this, and, yeah. and that's certainly true. What but but what are we trying to get through? And and part, I hear a few things coming out. That thing's very provocative. You know, one is uh, a humor. You know, is very hard to deal with. I, I I'm not sure that no fans deal with humor. I guess I was thinking of the football fans who put the bag over their head, right? Okay. You know, and. And I, I know it's yeah. different, you know, and I know we, can, I know we yeah. can make lots of distinctions, yeah. and that's all fine, but I guess, 
you, you know, it's still like, you know, it seems to me it's where, where you want to go with right. it. And I, I, I do think it, it, it's, it's interesting to say, well, it's about it, why it, it distracts us, this term fan, is that it, it makes it as if all fans somehow share the same kind yes. of emotional attachment. Yes. And so they're all, you know, so then there's just categories of fan, and you get in a certain kind of game. And, and it seems to me you want to say that there's this more complicated relationship. And I, I think this is always part of fan, fans love and hate. You know, I, I do think that's yeah. part of being a fan in any situation, maybe. Uh, yeah. uh, but that humor, I mean, I, I think it's true, humor is especially hard to talk about. I mean, it's, I think there's something about academic discourse here that we we got to be so serious, right? And we got to wear all our clothes. And, you know, there's, there's, like, there's, there's like these rules about what you can and cannot do uh, during your talk. Uh, uh, I don't mind the New Yorker question, but we'll get to that later. But, uh, so, so I guess that's, I guess that's that my question then is, you know, that, uh, so I'm going I'm to yeah. totally agree with, with you uh, so far, but then the question is, so what would you want to do with it? Like, right. where do you want to take this to say, okay, now... This is, okay. I can't get to where I want to get to, so that's, I still haven't heard where you want to get to. Right, so um, so one of the things about this is that my thinking on this thesis has seriously developed over the course, right? At first I was just doing this ethnographic study, and um, there's even been like serious developments in my concept of the thesis like yesterday, after I'd already made my thesis presentation, so <laughs> fortunately nothing that's going to bork it, but, um, but uh, I think that for me, it, it, the thing that I am... Um, really most deeply interested in that maybe I didn't fully express through this is it's a concern for the calcification of like which particular groups of fans that we are going to study. Um, so right, there's there's this whole thing where we study people who write fan fiction. Um, you know, we study people who are in this, this tradition of media fans um, and, and who are not quote feral fans, which is a term that some people will use for, for those who did not sort of come up through the, the Star Trek to, to whatever. Um, you know, and, and also, you know, if we're studying male fans, we study certain behaviors of theirs, and if we're studying female fans, we study other be behaviors that are theirs. Mm -hmm. So when you bring up humor with football fans, yeah, there's a lot of stuff about men doing parody, and some of that, most of that is not actually in conversation with people who would call themselves fan study scholars. Um, and there's, you know, so, so it's, it's just, I feel like there's all these calcifications that are existing and I would really like to, um, or that are beginning to come to be, and I would really like to sort of smash those down. And as I've been thinking about it, I think that maybe the idea of audience studies is where I want to go with this. Um, the idea that there are audiences that are here, um, not in the way that Jonathan Gray is talking about them, as, as inhabiting very set points, but rather as, um, as, a, as a more cited thing, right? Uh, as a more uh, individual thing for each community. Um, <coughs> I'd like to maybe steer the conversation a little bit differently. Um, okay, from, from the academic institution and on to more commercial applications. Mm -hmm. Because I know that um, your interests, just knowing you, <laughs> um, are in both spheres. Um, yeah. And I'm wondering what the implications of this work are for um, you know the people producing content mm -hmm. um, as well as people in marketing. Yeah, so I've been thinking about this a lot actually, um, as I know that you also know. Um, and one of the things is I think that that people's perceptions of what a fan is who are in the sort of corporate and, and entertainment world are very unmixed, right? They're very much focused on the idea that fans are giving them adulation and completely love everything they do. And I think that in recent years that's been challenged to some degree and people don't necessarily understand that um, even though they maybe are not purely loving everything you do, that's not necessarily the end of the world, right? That you can that you can look at reactions and be like, okay, here, here are these reactions to my work, some of them are good, some of them are bad. How can I play to these to keep everybody interested in the um, I haven't gotten too far into that because I've been mostly focused on actually writing the thesis. <laughs> but I'm, I'm looking forward to exploring that a little more and thinking harder about um, very controversial things like, like Twilight, right? Where, man, all the people on Twilight went to see the Twilight movies and make fun of them in the theaters. And man, they were they were putting some more money in the pockets of, of the people who were who were putting on the Twilight movies. So I think that it's an interesting way to go for, for marketing and for um, commercial applications. But...
Yeah, well, I, I'm sort of drawn, uh, my own one interesting humor I've drawn back to Murray Douglas, who suggests that humor emerges when we have intensely contradictory ideas yeah. in our heads at the same moment. Yeah. And humor is the way we negotiate through those contradictions. Absolutely. Uh, you know, so it's not, think about the male fans for a moment. Historically, there has been a discourse with a fan that have not written in academia about male fans using humor to negotiate the <coughs> knowledge base of a text and to signal their emotional distance from it yep. as a way of negotiating what it means to be a fan and yep. a male at the same time. So the question, and then traditionally that's opposed to the more immediately engaged female fans whom romance or melodrama have been the dominant modes. Yep. So I'm wondering how that gets complicated uh, by this reading. Are we, is, are the female fans simply adopting the male posture as it's been traditionally described, or is there the intensity or ambivalence about closeness and distance, uh, right. or, or critical engagement and an emotional investment that's very different from what's been characterized as male? So I think that it depends on which specific <coughs> group you're talking about. I think that for the Twilight group, I would say that yes, it is the same impulse, um, because because of the fact, specifically, that the text is so highly gendered, and, and Twilight fans are represented as so female and so incredibly like irrational, and you know every you know just every possible term that you could use for that. I think that there really is something happening with the Twilight fan group where they are both drawn to the text and, and absolutely have to somehow negotiate this. I'm not a girl like that. Um, however. The fan hunting community, which I'm also looking at, I think, is is different in some ways, right? It's, it's equally, the human standards are equally overlooked, but many of them um, do speak to a closeness to the text that, that doesn't come up as much in, in Twilight, that, that is more, um, more mixed. So I think that it's a really great insight, and I think that both are true for different communities, and I think that this just points back to why we can't say, like, and then here are wall fans, right? Like, why I can't just propose the category of wall fans who like to make fun of a text and, like, leave it there, which would be very neat, and let me tell you how much I would love to do that. <laughs> but, but I can't do that because different communities of fans um, are using humor and interacting with, with the text in different ways. Generally speaking, I would say that the media has, has gotten nicer to fans in the time that I've been in, in fandom, and I think that that is true. Um, so I guess I'm optimistic, but, but then their coverage of Twilight fans has been remar like has been a throwback, which is part of what interests me in it, right? Um, because it seemed like fan communities were getting treated more and more reasonably um, from even just from the time that I, I started becoming involved in Harry Potter fandoms to now, they're treated much more sympathetically. Um, but Twilight fans are this real case where they're like back to all of the things that are, you know, back to describing all the scary things about fans, back to the Beatlemaniacs, back to, you know, um, all of those stereotypes. So I, I don't know what to say on that topic. I think it probably is a little bit, I mean, there's, there's not really the same social panic that I think existed around the Beatlemaniacs, so that's good, <laughs> at least. Um, I, you know, so I, I have a lot of ambivalence on that. Um, I have a question about uh, corporeality. Corporeality, yeah. 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 <laughs> so a lot of, like you said, Beale Maniacs, for example, yeah. as a reference, and a lot of this talk about how women relate to these sort of uh, these media that they have an effective relationship with uh, is about, the, yeah, like this. So like this is different. Yeah. A lot of, one of the ways this is different plot like is that these people are in a physical space screaming at an actual person I assume. Uh, yes, it's, it's their, it, this is <laughs> the LA Twilight. Uh, so, then, so the, what I'm curious about is if you have thoughts about the sort of interface between on the one hand 
this sort of uh, intellectualized humor, like you talk about right. all of the all of the references that have to go uh -huh. with the mannerism. Right. In contrast ha -ha. to this kind of fan behavior, which is not online, and can it be done in a lol fan? Yes, it way? can. In fact, uh, Twatlight has done many things where they actually <laughs> showed up to things that they knew that there were going to be. It's, it's a lot like right when Anonymous comes and like you know, live troll somebody. <laughs> they, they like, would, they'll do things like they'll organize like a Twilight prom, which is going to happen. Um, this is something that has actually legitimately happened. Like Stephanie Meyer did throw a Twilight prom that was for serious business. So they'll show up to like a bookstore or whatever and have like their Twilight prom and they'll all like cosplay, but in really ridiculous over the top ways. And sometimes they'll do the thing where they somehow are embodying a macro or whatever. Um, so so they'll, they'll show up in person, and they they actually do have a lot of, of physical meeting. I was surprised when I started looking at the community. I just didn't have time to talk about all this. But a lot of them talk on the phone, um, text message. I actually interviewed some people in person who live in Boston, and they were totally cool with that. Um, it, was, it was a really interesting thing, because I think that people assume that a, a community like this is going to be totally disembodied. But in reality, the Twilighters were meeting up and were... were um, engaging face to face. Um, so I think that there is an important question about embodiment and like the way that, that people are talked about being embodied. Um, one other thing though is that I use this because it's nice to illustrate and it's hard to like just show a picture of a website and be like, hey guys. But these fans are probably also involved in online communities, right? So so it shouldn't be you shouldn't even though even though the, the language of embodiment is used to talk about Twilight fans, you shouldn't assume that that means that like the laughing fans are online and, and the serious fans are offline. Yeah, I guess I'm not thinking of them being, of like whether they're two different groups or not, but mm -hmm. thinking about like how, how, and the expression even one of them would work differently online and offline. Because right. the online one seems very intellectual and referential, and there's sort of, you know, the two kinds of humor. You could say, right, this sort of intellectual humor, this like belly laugh kind of humor. I yeah. can expect that that might map out into whether they're in a physical space or not. It doesn't really seem to. I mean, it seems like mostly they're, they're translating the intellectual humor into <coughs> some kind of a physical analog. So, uh, out of curiosity, I mean, I'm going to make a heuristic set of heuristic distinctions, and I know they're all bound together, but I'm curious about where your emphasis is within this. So there's the community aspect. It's embodied. It's yeah. corporal. You're looking at it. That's your, where you're doing your ethnographic research. There's an identity right. issue where this, it's, it's a highly yeah. affective mode. You've got to really understand how people think and see themselves. And there's maybe the issue of engagement, the activities, the manifestations, mm -hmm. the things that people right. do. Um, right. And they're all bound together. But yeah. if you had to say like where your where your interest really is, because this might a so bit solve the problem of the reification of a social group as fans or audiences yeah. or whatever. So this has really changed over the course of the thesis, and I think that that's why there's some amount of like confusion as to what my focus is, because until very recently I was confused as to what my focus was. Um, but but it really is about so so in in the thesis itself, my focus is definitely on the productions of the community and doing close readings of a number of, of things like those macros, and then I'm using the rest as um, as a uh, setting as, as sort of showing you like there's a lot more that we could do with this but, but here are the macros and the reason that I'm doing that is because that has been a traditional thing that people in fan studies have been doing right like they look at a fanfic and then they're going to do some kind of a, a focus on this fanfic um, you know they're, they're looking at a vid and they're doing a close reading of a vid um, I don't know if that actually answered your question but <laughs> my brain's a little poor no, no. <laughs> self-regulation mm -hmm. of the group, you seem to focus mostly on, and I thought it's really interesting, you sort of moved to say, let's not talk about the person, let's talk about the relationship between the person and the sex. Um, but thinking about, are there any <coughs> outliers, or because you have to be in, sort of, were there any outlier data points, yeah. but then also, like, maybe not, because you, it's a self-selecting group, but then, of course, there's always deviance. So how is it regulated in this community? It's, it's like you stepped into girl world. It really is. So this is something that I had, I mean, I really do not have time to talk about this in the thesis, otherwise I would go way into this stuff, right? So, so I've, I've 
there's all this really cool stuff that's actually happening with the relationships between people and, and so on, but, but instead, because I have only like 100 pages to write this in, I've, I've been focusing sort of on the, the things that they leave behind as they go through it. But in my, in my study, man, they will drum people out of the group. Um, and in fact, they, they will, there's like this whole language around what happens when somebody is starting to get too serious business or when somebody has gone too far and offended everybody, right? Like there's these two ways that you can get drummed out of the, the spotlight group. Um, and they'll talk about how you can like, you, you, you post that, what is the term? Not flail. You post a uh, flounce post. Right. So like when you've been drummed out of the group because everybody loathes you, either because you're too serious business or because you're too too making fun of things, traditionally people will post a flounce post about like, oh, I really hate Twatlight, right? And from their perspective, they're like, dude, Twatlight is full of horrible people who have just kicked me out by like making my life miserable. Uh, but everybody on Twatlight finds this really funny and they'll like make fun of the flounce post and so on. Well, what, how do you drive so. someone out? Uh, by basically being really mean to them and sending like like by posting macros that are I mean you know right by posting mean macros in contexts where they're going to be insulting and by posting animated gifs which I also didn't get a chance to talk about but there's like lots of animated gifs that they use to express emotions and posting those like ones of people eye rolling on all your posts and so on um, so it really it's like stepping into middle school a little bit <laughs> but. Yeah, very very strongly regulated community um, internally would be an entire thesis to talk about that. <laughs> My question is related and simple, but um, so going into girl, girl world, are there any men on this community? And they, like, what are their roles and how do they have to sort of negotiate that? Yeah, space? I so in my time on Spotlight, I encountered four men, um, and two of them are boyfriends of people who are there and two of them are gay. And the gay guys generally behave like, I mean, I, I hate making like general comments like this, but, but when I interviewed them, they were like, yeah, I totally outgirl the girls. And the guys who were on there were just like, I really like, I think they're funny. They're hilarious. Like these women are really funny and I like being here and my, my girlfriend's on here and she's really into it. And so like, it's fun for me to watch what's going on. And it gives you an insight into the minds of women, which I thought was sort of scary. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but so, so there were a very few, um, and everybody in Twilight was very excited to have them there, and was like, no, you should go talk to the guy. He can give you his perspective, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, internal polling was like, you know, 99% women. <laughs> um, and I have no reason to doubt that I mean, I'm sure it's not a scientific sample, but I have no reason to doubt that, that the polls were not reflective of like the people who are posting the most and so on, because they were posting the most everywhere. We should probably wrap up. And she will be on.